Uh, anyway, glad you're here. Everybody look over here. Say hello. First time she was here for the thing on Friday night. We're glad to have you back. Um, Y'all make sure you get to know her if you didn't get to know her Friday night at the fall festival. Um, uh, glad y'all are here. So far, nobody's out there except for my wife, Dorcas, but some other people hopefully will join us. Maybe some folks will join us on uh, that. A couple quick announcements. Um, so uh, only got two bridges left after tonight. Uh, the last one is November the 16th. And on November the 16th, we're going to have dinner that night and we're going to kind of have a celebration of the semester. So kind of an end of the semester celebration. Uh, typically what we do at our last meeting is any of our graduating seniors, if they want to share kind of what maybe BCM's meant to them, kind of what the Lord's taught them while they're in college, kind of like a last word, kind of like a will and testament, almost like you used to sign in your annuals, whatever. We'll do that that night and we'll just kind of wrap up the semester. Um, I know there's more classes after the Thanksgiving, but we'll be finishing up. We probably will have an exam break uh, during the week after we get back, but we haven't decided exactly which night that will be. If you have a preference as to when you might want to have an exam break that week, I know exams are actually not the next week, but we want to have just a fun night. We'll probably do something like maybe pancakes and hang out and just have fun. So if you're going to be around, uh, Malachi was asking on Friday night, if you're going to be around, if you'll let him know, because he's kind of keeping the list for us, he's going to be available um, that week after Thanksgiving. So if you're going to be here the week after Thanksgiving, we're just going to have a fun night. So it's nothing planned, no theme. We're just going to come hang out. But that'll be it for the semester, and then we'll be done. Um, but we're glad you're here. Small groups are still going on, a couple, you know, a couple more weeks before those will be done. Um, so if you haven't joined a small group, all the information's back there on the board. And it came to my attention before we started tonight that a lot of people don't realize that there's a dig deeper door back there. So after tonight, if you want to dig deeper on the subject, Tripp has made a little handout that you can take with you and study more uh, on that. Tripp's going to be speaking tonight. And so uh, the theme is committed for the long haul. So that's our theme for tonight. And that's a good thing to encourage all of us. Um, and uh, when Tripp and I were talking about tonight, he was kind of sharing what he was going to do. And we were talking about, well, Matthew's down in Florida at a music conference. And so uh, that meant I'm, I'm the backup, right? So anyway, we were talking about music. And a Tripp picked out a song that he wants us to do at the end. And then I was thinking about another song that really means a lot to me based on what he's going to be sharing tonight. Um, and it's, it's called uh, You're My All in All. And um, basically, uh, it's putting our emphasis and our thoughts all on Jesus. And that's going to be a part of what he's going to share about tonight. So we're going to start with that song. It's pretty easy. Um, and so if you don't know it, you can pick up on it. But let me just say a word of prayer as we get started. Father God, we give thanks for our gathering tonight. And we do pray, Lord, that you be in our midst and that you'd uh, speak to us tonight through Trip. And Lord, as we worship you, may you help us to set our mind on you. Pray these things in your name. Amen. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Let's do that again. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my guilt, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. 
When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. 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 Worthy is Good evening, y'all. So I'm going to have a little word of prayer. Dear Holy Father, thank you for today. As we're able to come together in this place, I pray that you would speak to us through this one speaker, and God, and of course, I'm speaking off of my words, but your words, dear God. Please thank you, God. Lord, that you would teach us what it means to be committed for the long haul and how to do that, Lord. And just how worthy you are um, to receive all of our um, submission and allegiance to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So, just to warn y'all, we're going to be jumping around a lot in the Bible tonight. So, first, we're going to be in Matthew 16, verse 24. Matthew 16, 24. So, tonight we're talking about being committed for the long haul. And the first question I want to ask is, what are we actually committing to doing for the long haul? And so, does anybody know the answer to that question? I don't know. No, just here. Birth to death. What is what are we doing for the long haul? Hmm? Yeah. Coming one of Jesus, okay. Malcolm. Unbroken fellowship with Jesus, okay. Anybody else? Glorify God's name, yeah. So this is perhaps a familiar verse. We did the version in Mark at uh, the beginning of the semester. This is Matthew. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. And so we're talking about following Jesus. And so that is sort of the whole theme of being committed is following Jesus. But so now becomes the question of how do we end up following Jesus for the long term or the long haul? And so the first thing is that we have to make a choice. Okay. So go to Joshua 24, 14. Joshua 24, 14. We're 
So Joshua 24, 14 through 15 says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites. In whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So, looking at this, it's interesting in verse 14 it says, Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and Egypt and serve the Lord. So, you gotta remember at this time, there were different nations going around, and so there were different idols. That would have been objects. And so the Israelites would have oftentimes incorporated these idols into um, their lifestyle and worship these idols along with the Lord. And so to say that you would throw away the gods um, that your ancestors would worship, so it's basically like literally throwing away something, you know, object, and getting rid of it, and choosing to serve the Lord. And so, what are some, perhaps, gods or idols that we might have in our lives that we choose instead of Jesus? Social media, okay. People. Thoughts and things that were taught from our family. Political leaders and government. So there are different things in our lives that can um, oftentimes become idols that take the place of our allegiance to God. But he demands first place. And so we have to make a choice of who are we going to serve those things for God. Just a few more passages. So go back to Matthew chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 24. So not 16.4, this is 6.4. Does no one can serve two masters? Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So, some can just say money, some say mammon, basically stuff, okay? And so, stuff, like we just talked about, can not only be material things, but it can also be people or ideas or whatever. So anything that takes the place of God in his truth is something that we don't need to be messing with, right? We need to be focused on God. Now go to Matthew 10, 37 to 39. It says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. So even here, Jesus, like, talked about with things you've been taught maybe by your parents, or even, like I said, people. You know, it's people that are closest to us that Jesus is saying, you have to forsake them to follow me. And so not taking up their cross. We talked about denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following Jesus. And so taking up our cross, what did that mean again? Who can 
remind the group of what it means to take the cross. Okay. So self denial. What, Daniel? Uh, self denial. Self denial. Okay. So dying to self, maybe even dying physically for Jesus. And so he's saying here whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And it goes back to what we were talking about in. Matthew 16, where it talks about denying yourself, take a cross while you can. And so this is a very key point, and Jesus is very clear that there is nothing else that matters, basically. It's very exclusive. Right? Now, Revelation 3:14. Another note about the, you know, flip to it, but on Matthew 6 or Matthew 10 that we just looked at, Jim Elliott, who was a missionary to Ecuador to persons that were called at that time, they were called the Alcas, which means savage, but they're really um, the Warinari, which is what they're called today. But he went there and he served as a missionary there. And he, and along with some other friends, ended up being killed by the natives, by the Alka. And Jim Elliott had a quote that he basically lived by, and that was, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot have to gain what he cannot lose. And so Jesus, we can't lose him. He's not going to leave us. And so are we willing to give up the thing that we want, even the people that we love, to follow Jesus, and even our lives to follow Jesus. Revelation 3.14 says, to the angel, well, 3.14 and following, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So, again, Jesus calls us to make a choice. You're either hot or you're cold. There's no lukewarm in the middle. Otherwise, Jesus has nothing to do with you. And so you have to make that decision. Are you on one side of the fence or in the other side of the fence? If you're on the fence, at some point you have to make a decision and then stick with it. After you've made the choice to follow Jesus, you need to understand your orders. Where it gets very spooky ish. John 15, 12 to 17. Says, My command is this love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so the word, whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command love each other. So, Jesus had great love for us and died for us, and we are, because he is our friend. And so, if we're a friend of Jesus and we know his business, if we 
know what the vowel is, then that's where we get our origin. We get it from Jesus. And so, what are some ways in which we can know what the orders are? The Bible, okay, Tyson, the Bible, yeah, Daniel. I was going to say he said the question one more time, but. What's that? I was going to say, can you say the question one more time? What are some ways in which you can know what the orders of Jesus are? Oh, um, yeah, like I think he said it something like, well, it's the word of God. Um, and that's the only thing I can feel like you can base your beliefs and doctrines on. So. So the word of God will also base your belief in what you want to say. Okay, commandments. Reading one now. Reading the fine print. Explain that, Malachi. Okay. Yeah. So focusing on even looking at the details. Not missing anything in the scripture. Don't try to change it to what you want to say, but take the voice that is. Yeah, in Second Timothy, you don't have to go there. Well, sure, you go there. More fun. So in 2 Timothy, chapter 4, Paul is writing to Timothy as the pastor in, at, at the church in Ephesus, and he's talking to him about the importance of doctrine and all of the struggle that he's going to have and to be ready and um, to persevere despite the persecution. And so it says in chapter 4, verse 1 and following, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. If you hardship, do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. So, like Christian said, there's this sound doctrine that comes from the word. And we have to go with that, not what we want it to say. Now, there are a bunch of people that will read the word and say, you know, well, it says this, and blah, 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 but it doesn't really say that. And then people will say, oh, that sounds good. I'll, I'll go listen to that. And then they basically get people around them to tell them what they want to hear and then justify the scriptures when that's not really what it says. But it doesn't matter what you think it says, that doesn't change what it actually says. It's not about what you think, it's about what is true. And so that's a good one. So Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Prayer is another way to know what our orders are. And remember, prayer is not a one-way conversation, it's a two-way dialogue. And so we're talking to God, we're talking to God, but then also listening for what God has to say. And so verse 9 through 13 says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. At least not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And so, what's key about this is your kingdom come, your will be done. I want to do what you want, and it's all about God. You know, give us our daily bread, give us what we need. And as we read in Matthew 6, where it talks about not worrying, God's going to take care of all of what you need. You need to focus on what he needs you to do and seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and the rest we ought to do, the rest we taken care of. That was our theme last year, so most of y'all weren't here, but we're back. Um, so, but you did t-shirt <laughs> for some reason. Second Timothy 3, 16 to 17. Says all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, for being correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Essentially, like I said earlier, the word helps us to understand what we're supposed to do so that we can be servants of God and know and be equipped for what God would have us do. The last one is Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so we use the word to know what we're supposed to do. But after we know what to do, we actually have to do it. So Matthew 5, 14 to 16. That you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So, after we understand what to do through prayer and the word, we do the works for the purpose of glorifying God before other people. And so what are some of the things that we can do, understanding from the word, to glorify God? What are some of those things we're called to do? Pray. Pray. Yeah. Okay. Thanksgiving. Give thanks to God. Yeah. Love others. Forgive. Good. Use the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, peace, kindness, good things. We're still in the self control. Share the gospel again. Yeah. <laughs> kind of the whole point. <laughs> Good. So we can talk about doing this stuff, and but at some point you have to actually do it and discipline yourself to do it because it gets hard and your flesh wants to not do it. So you have to apply some discipline. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27.
Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body, make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So there's some discipline involved, and again, we have to deny ourselves, and we're just part of that discipline. And if you've ever worked out regularly, this is very important. This is essentially what you're doing. Your, your body doesn't want to do what you're telling it to do, but you have to do it anyways. And so I'm taking PE this semester, I'm taking tennis. So one day of the week we do tennis class, the other day we, we have a weekly workout we do at home. And, um, and I do it in the dormitory because you have to wear a mask at the rec center, I'm like, I'm not gonna do that. So bless their heart, the people below me that have to do with me doing jumping jacks, I don't know what's going on, I don't know what they hear, but. <laughs> It's very painful when you do a workout, but I have to get it done. And so on the thing, it says to increase intensity, to decrease. I always go with the decrease intensity. And so I was doing like push-ups on my knees yesterday because I'm not gonna do a minute of real push-ups. But I'm, I'm gonna kill myself in the process. So but that's the kind of thing we have to do when we're following Jesus, is even though it doesn't feel good, even though our flesh doesn't want to do it, we have to do it anyways for the glory of God and to follow Jesus. And so at that point, if it is a matter of discipline, you can discipline all you want, but why would you discipline yourself for something you don't want to do. So the question is, why do we want to follow Jesus? Why do you want to glorify him? No can answer. Heaven's pretty enticing. Heaven's pretty enticing, okay. He died for me, so I guess I I I have to show my appreciation. Jesus died for us and show our appreciation by following him. Yes. Right. He'll give us grace and forgiveness even when we mess up. I mean, really, the whole point is Jesus died for us. I mean, that's the, that's the reason we follow him. And so going to Hebrews 12. The Hebrews twelve one. New Testament. Says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary in his heart. So, I really like the in verse 3, where it says, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And so, 
just to think about what Jesus went through and what he did for us. And so when we understand the depth of which Jesus suffered, then when we grasp that, we understand just how much he loves us. And so that should compel us to follow him and glorify him. And so it's very interesting that the creator of the universe, I'm taking genetics this semester, and it's very interesting how the whole genetics works because you basically have, you know, probably in biology one, like DNA to RNA to protein, and then that's it. Well, it's like 10 times more complicated. And at one point, we thought that about 90, not basically 99% of the human genome was junk DNA. It did nothing, but just sit there. Well, now we know it actually does a lot of regulatory stuff. And so every day of genetics class, things get more and more complicated. And so just to think that this is the language with which God made human genome and how genes work in all species for the most part that the God who did that and who knit us together and made us in his image and just created us the God who created the entire universe which has billions of galaxies and billions of stars and all of this stuff that basically displays his glory and is fixed in such a way so that we can live on earth and that the earth doesn't like explode, that the same God who did that chose us, these little specks of dust that die for the specks of dust. And so to think that the creator died for his creation, I mean like, if you play with Play-Doh, do you, you don't normally die for your Play-Doh, okay? But, I mean, if you make a little sculpture and it's like, you know, in, you know, it's, you did like a sculpture of yourself, like a self-portrait of Play-Doh. And then that Play-Doh, rebels against you and like beats you up. I mean, like, <laughs> that's kind of how it is with God. I mean, we basically beat God up. Like, <laughs> we, we rebel against him. And so, but God died for the Plato. And it makes no sense. But he did it anyway. And so, let's go to Jeremiah 17, 9. So it says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and beyond cure, who can understand it? Now Galatians 2, 16. Praise the Lord, I'm going to flip right to it, also. So Galatians 2, 16. The New Testament. Right after 2 Corinthians.
says, Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So, the final thing is to consider what Jesus did for you. And so we read in Jeremiah that our hearts are deceitfully wicked above all else. You can understand it. Now we read that you can't be justified or basically be forgiven of your sins by doing the works of the law. So basically, we have a big problem <laughs> and that we're bad and we can't do anything about it <laughs> to get forgiveness from God. And so, but Jesus died on the cross so that we can be forgiven. And the Bible says that he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. And to be right with righteousness of God is to be in right relationship with God, not by anything we could do, but not by anything we could do, but through Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. And so to kind of sum up what we talked about, the whole reason we follow Jesus is because what he did for us. And so we need to make a choice. Are we willing to follow Jesus and trust in him as our Lord and Savior, giving up everything else to follow him? And if so, we need to be disciplined. But when it gets tough, it's the desire to know Jesus and to glorify him because of what he's done for us that helps us to press on. Does that make sense? Any questions, comment? Actually, I will say one. So, I want to dig deeper. So, it basically asks similar questions. One of the questions is What are you committing to, or what is your purpose for committing something like that? And so, you have to figure out why am I committing, what am I committing to, and why? What, or what is my commitment? And then I asked about what is my action plan? And it lists different spiritual disciplines that just encourage y'all to think about how can I practice Bible study, prayer, fasting, confession, worship, fellowship, all that stuff, evangelism, mission. And then I asked the question, what has God done for you? What has Jesus done for you? Because that's the key that's going to help you move forward and understand what God has done so that when it gets tough, you'll remember what Jesus went through for you and that you will have that desire to glorify him out of thanksgiving, what he's done. Questions, comments, concerns? That was a great sermon. I really liked it. What are some ways in which we can trust God and so that when we have difficulties, when we don't know what's going to happen, that we can know the God, that we can trust God? What are some things? Um, you, can do, you can read some of God's promises. Um, he says that his word never come back void. So if you remind yourself that God never lies and that his promises are true, um, it'll, it, it just gives you encouragement to remind you you can trust what's going on, even though you don't understand why. It's, it says 
that he, you know, that he cares um, much more than us in the sparrows. So we shouldn't really worry about our situation. He dressed the lilies. He would dress us, you know. Um, so we just, you know, it's just those promises just give us encouragement and um, strength when we don't really see, know why everything is happening the way it is. Colossians 3 says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude. So that's something he said. Remembering what he's done, you know, they, um, the scripture says, the confidence of things not yet seen. And so, when we Bible, I've heard this. I'm weird, but I've heard before that faith is, isn't blind faith when it comes to what the Bible comes to. It's not blind faith. We have confidence in God because of what He's done in the past. He took the Israelites out of Egypt. He took down kingdoms and He let them go into the Promised Land and all this stuff. And even in our own lives, God has brought us through things. So remembering what God has done, we can remember that God did in the past. He never changes, understanding that's the truth, and that he's still going to be faithful later. And so that's where faith comes in. So like Malachi said, we need to remember what God has done and trusting him. Um, can I say something? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I don't know how I'm coming across. Um, when um, when we're talking about faith and and you're talking about Plato being like little Plato people, um, God asks of us to be like little children. Little children do not understand the wisdom of the parent. They don't even understand the responsibilities or the burden that the parents carry, just like we don't understand God's plan, but he asks us to be like little children of joy so that, because children play, but he's not asking us just to play, but he's asking us to be, to have that. I think he's asking us to have that nature to totally trust. So it doesn't take away our joy. Um, but also and so you can live in faith. Children do not live in worry when they have a loving parent. They are complete. They're satisfied. They're ready to try new adventures. They're ready to, to do whatever the parent says. They're, they're happy. And um, when they have an issue, they take it to the parent. But also going along with your Play-Doh thing instead of children, Play-Doh cannot fix Play-Doh. Play-Doh people cannot fix Play-Doh people. Only the maker, the one that breathes life, can fix the Play-Doh. And we're broken. And when, you're, when you ask earlier, why would we, I think you ask, why would we follow Jesus? Why would we uh, do what he says? Didn't you ask that? You did. Why would we not? What is there that we can even do for ourselves to fix it? We try so many things. We think we're smart or we think that we know better or we just want to go and do our own thing from a rebellious heart and say, well, I've got this. I can do it. I don't need God. But you're right, Trip. We are like little Play-Doh people. We cannot fix ourselves. Pieces fall off. We're broken. We can't grow ourselves. There's nothing that that Play-Doh can do for itself. And so, but God sees us even better than that. He breathed life into us to give us life as his creation. And he loves us as children. And when we're looking at that, 
why would we not go for the gold? Why would we not? Why would we satisfy ourselves or, or just to, to go for something smaller and lower when it's so great of what all the things that you've mentioned in red are, are, are things that are calling us because you're, you're telling us out of the word. Listen to this. Show this. Look what God has done for us. Look where Jesus did. Look to the great links that he gave us. And, you know, that just you really just the picturing in my mind, which I thank you for the little Play-Doh people trying to help each other. We're just helpless. And so why would we not be the children that have life in us? and reach for our father and everything and and jesus and everything that he has in store for us like like those witnesses are trying to say come on get up pay attention listen it's better we have nothing without christ so i really appreciate that and i thank you that because it put a different thought in my mind not what's keeping me back or you know keeping me going but why would i not reach for the best and try and go with God, even if I can't see it, just be the child that he's asked me to be, go where he asked me to go, do what he asked me to do, and live in that, that peace and that joy. Anyway, thank you, Trip. Thank you. Mount Catholic Dear Heavenly Father, we are like the plate of people who cannot fix themselves or fix each other, but you are our Father. And we thank you for Jesus who died on the cross to save us from what we could not save ourselves from, which is our sin. And Jesus, I thank you for being obedient and willing to die so that we can live. Please help us to understand the depth of your love, Jesus. We would desire all the more to follow you and trust in you with all joy for your glory. So we're going to uh, finish out with a song that Tripp requested. And um, it's appropriate because it's simply I have decided to follow Jesus. And here's, here's the thing about following Jesus. Uh, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And so um, the goal is not to run as fast as you can. The goal is to just keep running so you make it. And so that requires us every day to get up and make a new decision to follow Jesus. So at age 11, I became a believer. I asked Jesus to come in my heart. I, I decided to follow him at age 11. But this morning when I woke up, I had to make that same decision again today to follow Jesus today. And if we wake up tomorrow and the next day, it's that constant decision to decide to follow Jesus. So as we close out tonight, I want, I want it to kind of be our prayer that we're committing ourselves to do this for the long haul. Because um, that's, that's really what it's all about. It's just following him for the long haul. So I have decided to follow Jesus.
I still will follow. Lord, I go with thee. I still will follow. Lord, I go with me. I still will follow. No turning back. No turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Let's sing that, that quick verse just one more time. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. May that be your prayer tonight that you just keep on carrying that cross, keep on holding it for the long haul. Um, Thanks for being here tonight. Hope you guys have a great evening. And hang around and uh, uh, get to know folks. Uh, should we get to know you, please? Zahira? Zahira. Get it right. Woohoo! Make sure y'all hang out and get to know her. And I'm glad y'all are here. Hope you have a blessed week. See you Wednesday for lunch. Uh, one last thing I didn't mention earlier uh, the deadline for sending out some remissions is Wednesday. So if you're thinking about doing send me now, you need to get your application in by Wednesday. So if you have more questions, let me know. All right, y'all have a good night. All right. Hello. Hey. Hey. You done? Fixing the, let me let me stop the recording.